The poem's called Having a Coke with You. It's even more fun than going to St. Sebastian, Irun, Ondai, Biarritz, Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the Travesera de Gracia in Barcelona. Partly because in your orange shirt you look like a better, happier St. Sebastian. Partly because of my love for you. Partly because of your love for yogurt. Partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches. Partly because of the secrecy our smiles take on before people in statuary. It is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive as statuary when right in front of it, in the warm New York four o'clock light. We are drifting back and forth between each other like a tree breathing through its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. You suddenly wonder why in the world anyone ever did them. I look at you, and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world except possibly for the Polish rider occasionally, and anyway it's in the Frick, which thank heavens you haven't gone to yet so we can go together the first time. And the fact that you move so beautifully more or less takes care of futurism, just as at home I never think of the nude descending a staircase or at a rehearsal a single drawing of Leonardo or Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them? when they never got the right person to stand near the tree when the sun sank. Or for that matter, Marino Marini, when he didn't pick the rider as carefully as the horse. It seems they were all cheated of some marvelous experience, which is not going to go wasted on me, which is why I'm telling you about it. The next two poems are sort of walking around New York type poems, which I like to write. and. I think the events in them are quite explicable, and, and you know, it isn't just what I see, but what I'm thinking about while I'm talking to. First one is called Poem. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing, and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard, so it was really snowing and raining, and I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. And suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. And the next poem I'm going to read is simply called Poem. And it's occasioned just by personal feeling. Hate is only one of many responses. True, hurt, and hate go hand in hand. But why be afraid of hate? It is only there. Think of filth. Is it really awesome? Neither is hate. Don't be shy of unkindness, either. It's cleansing and allows you to be direct, like an arrow that feels something. Out and out meanness, too, lets love breathe. You don't have to fight off getting in too deep. You can always get out if you're not too scared. An ounce of prevention's enough to poison the heart. Don't think of others until you have thought of yourself are true. All of these things, if you feel them, will be graced by a certain reluctance and turn into gold. If felt by me, will be smilingly deflected by your mysterious concern. Well, the next poem uh, is uh, one of a series uh, of poems that I wrote uh, at work on my lunch hour, which uh, City Lights is going to publish uh, next year under the title Lunch Poems because Ferlinghetti thought it was so amusing that anyone was sitting around typing during their lunch hour. So he said, why don't you put them together and we'll publish them as Lunch Poems. Um, this one is called Adieu to Norman, Bonjour to Joan and Jean Paul. It's for a friend of mine who was going to France and I had to hurry up and do it because I was having a farewell lunch with him. It is 12.10 in New York, and I am wondering if I will finish this in time to meet Norman for lunch. Ah, lunch. I think I am going crazy. What with my terrible hangover and the weekend coming up at excitement-prone Kenneth Cox. I wish I was staying in town and working on my poems at Jones Studio for a new book by Grove Press, which they will probably not print. But it is good to be several floors up in the dead of night, wondering whether you are any good or not. And the only decision you can make is that you did it. Yesterday, I looked up the roof frame on a map 
and was happy to find it like a bird flying over Paris, a ses environs, which unfortunately did not include Seine et Oise, which I don't know, as well as a number of other things. And Alan is back talking about God a lot, and Peter is back not talking very much, and Joe has a cold and is not coming to Kenneth, although he is coming to lunch with Norman. I suspect he is making a distinction. Well, who isn't? I wish I were reeling around Paris instead of reeling around New York. I wish I weren't reeling at all. It is spring. The ice is melted. The recar is being poured. We are all happy and young and toothless. It is the same as old age. The only thing to do is simply continue. Is that simple? Yes, it is simple because it is the only thing to do. Can you do it? Yes, you can because it is the only thing to do. Blue light over the Bois de Boulogne, it continues. The Seine continues. The Louvre stays open, it continues, it hardly closes at all. The Bar Americain continues to be French. De Gaulle continues to be Algerian, as does Camus. Shirley Goldfarb continues to be Shirley Goldfarb. And Jane Hazen continues to be Jane Frolicker, I think. And Irving Sandler continues to be the balayeur des artistes, and so do I. Sometimes I think I'm in love with painting. And surely the piscine d'Aligny continues to have water in it. And the floor continues to have tables and newspapers and people under them. And surely we shall not continue to be unhappy. We shall be happy, but we shall continue to be ourselves. Everything continues to be possible. René Sharp, Pierre Reverdy, Samuel Beckett, it is possible, isn't it? I love Reverdy for saying yes, though I don't believe it. This poem is from the love poem. And um, it's sort of like uh, I get the idea of uh, Marianne Moore in a way because the title is part of the poem and also as it, it defines something, but I don't know how. The poem is called Having a Coke with You. It's even more fun than going to San Sebastian, Irun, Ondai, Biarritz, Bayonne, or being sick to my stomach on the Travesera de Gracia in Barcelona. Partly because in your orange shirt you look like a better, happier St. Sebastian. Partly because of my love for you. Partly because of your love for yogurt. Partly because of the fluorescent orange tulips around the birches. Partly because of the secrecy our smiles take on before people in statuary. It is hard to believe when I'm with you that there can be anything as still, as solemn, as unpleasantly definitive as statuary when right in front of it. In the warm New York four o'clock light. We are drifting back and forth between each other like a tree breathing through its spectacles. And the portrait show seems to have no faces in it at all, just paint. You suddenly wonder why in the world anyone ever did them. I look at you, and I would rather look at you than all the portraits in the world except possibly for the Polish rider occasionally. And anyway, it's in the frick. But thanks heavens you haven't gone to yet so we can go together the first time. And the fact that you move so beautifully more or less takes care of futurism, just as at home I never think of the nude descending a staircase or at a rehearsal a single drawing of Leonardo or Michelangelo that used to wow me. And what good does all the research of the Impressionists do them when they never got the right person to stand near the tree when the sun sank? Or for that matter, Marino Marini, when he didn't pick the rider as carefully as the horse. It seems they were all cheated of some marvelous experience which is not going to go wasted on me, which is why I'm telling you about it. Ode to Joy. We shall have everything we want, and there'll be no more dying on the pretty plains or in the supper clubs. For our symbol will acknowledge vulgar materialistic laughter over an insatiable sexual appetite, and the streets will be filled with racing forms, and the photographs of murderers and narcissists and movie stars will swell from the walls and books alive in steaming rooms, to press against our burning flesh, not once but interminably, as water flows downhill into the full-lipped basin, and the adder dives for the ultimate ostrich egg, and the feather cushion preens beneath a reclining monolith that's sweating with post-exertion visibility and sweetness near the grave of love. No more dying. We shall see the grave of love as a lovely sight and temporary near the elm that spells the lovers' names in roots. And there'll be no more music but the ears and lips, and no more wit but tongues and ears, and no more drums but ears to thighs, as evening signals nudities unknown to ancestors' imaginations. And the imagination itself will stagger like a tired paramour of ivory under the sculptural necessities of lust that never falters, 
like a six-mile runner from Sweden or Liberia covered with gold. As lava flows up and over the far-down somnolent city's abdication and the hermit always wanting to be lone is lone at last, and the weight of external heat crushes the heat-hating Puritan, whose self-defeating vice becomes a proper sepulcher at last that love may live. Buildings will go up into the dizzy air as love itself goes in and up the reeling life that it has chosen for once or all, while in the sky a feeling of intemperate fondness will excite the birds to swoop and veer like flies crawling across absorbed limbs that weep a pearly perspiration on the sheets of brief attention and the hairs dry out that summon anxious declaration of the organs as they rise like buildings to the needs of temporary neighbors pouring hunger through the heart to feed desire in intravenous ways like the ways of gods with humans in the innocent combination of light and flesh or as the legends ride their heroes through the dark to found great cities where all life is possible to maintain as long as time, which wants us to remain for cocktails in a bar and after dinner lets us live with it. No more dying. The next poem is called To Hell With It. And the actual occasion of the poem is not that two friends of mine died, but obviously... It was in the back of my mind, if not the front, when I wrote it. And I think that probably after the initial shock, death makes me angrier rather than sadder as a, an event. To hell with it. Hungry winter this winter. Meaningful hints at dismay, to be touched, to see labeled as such. Perspicacious Colette and Vladimirovich meet with sickness and distress. It is because of sunspots on the sun. I clean it off with an old sock and go on. And blonde Gregory dead in fallout on a highway with his Broadway wife, the last of the Lafayettes. How I hate subject matter, melancholy intruding on the vigorous heart, the soul telling itself you haven't suffered enough, hialo miel, and all things that don't change, photographs, monuments, memories of Bunny and Gregory and me in costume bowing to each other in the audience like jinxes, Nothing now can be changed as, last crying, no tears will dry, and Bunny will never change her writing of the bear, nor Greg bear me any further gift beyond liking my poems, no new poems for him, and a big red railroad handkerchief from the country in his sports car, so like another actor. For sentiment is always intruding on form, the immaculate disgust of the mind, beaten down by pain and the vileness of life's flickering disapproval, Endless torment, pretending to be the rose of acknowledgement, courage, and fruitless absolution, hence the word hip, to be cool, decisive, precise, yes, while the barn door hits you in the face each time you get up, because the wind, seeing you slim and gallant, rises to embrace its darling poet. It thinks I'm mysterious. All diseases are exchangeable. Wind, you'll have a terrible time smothering my clarity, a void behind my eyes, into which existence continues to stuff its wounded limbs as I make room for them on one after another filthy page of poetry. To the film industry in crisis, not you, lean quarterlies and swarthy periodicals, with your studious incursions toward the pomposity of ants. Nor you, experimental theater, in which emotive fruition is wedding poetic insight perpetually. Nor you, promenading grand opera, obvious as an ear, though you are close to my heart. But you, motion picture industry, it's you I love. In times of crisis, we must all decide again and again whom we love and give credit where it's due. Not to my starched nurse, who taught me how to be bad and not bad rather than good, and has lately availed herself of this information. Not to the Catholic Church, which is at best an over-solemn introduction to cosmic entertainment. Not to the American Legion, which hates everybody. But to you, glorious silver screen, tragic technicolor, amorous cinemascope, stretching this division and startling stereophonic sound, with all your heavenly dimensions of reverberations and iconoclasms, to Richard Barthelmus as the tolerable boy, barefoot and in pants, 
Jeanette McDonald of the flaming hair and lips and long, long neck. Sue Carroll as she sits for eternity on the damaged fender of a car and smiles. Ginger Rogers with her page boy bob like a sausage on her shuffling shoulders. Peach Melba voiced Fred Astaire of the feet. Eric von Stroheim, the seducer of mountain climbers' gasping spouses. The, the Tarzans. Each and every one of you. I cannot bring myself to prefer Johnny Weissmuller to Lex Barker. I cannot. Mae West in a furry sled. Her bordello radiance and bland remark. Rudolph Valentino of the moon. It's crushing passion. And Moonlight too, the gentle Norma Shearer. Miriam Hopkins dropping her champagne glass off Joel McRae's yacht and crying into the dappled sea. Clark Gable rescuing Jean Tierney from Russia. And Alan Jones rescuing Kitty Carlisle from Harpo Mark. Cornell Wilde coughing blood on the piano keys. While Merle Oberon berates. Marilyn Monroe in her little spike heels reeling through Niagara Falls. Joseph Cotton puzzling. And Orson Welles puzzled. And Dolores Del Rio eating orchids for lunch and breaking mirrors. Gloria Swanson reclining. And Jean Harlow reclining and wiggling. And Alice Faye reclining and wiggling and singing. Myrna Loy being calm and wise. William Powell in his stunning urbanity. Elizabeth Taylor blossoming. Yes, two others. The great, the near do pass quickly and return in dreams. My love. Long may you illumine space with your marvelous appearances, delays, and enunciations. And may the money of the world glitteringly cover you as you rest after a long day under the Klieg lights with your faces in packs for our edification. The way the clouds come often at night, but the heavens operate on the star system. It is a divine precedent you perpetuate. Roll on, reels of celluloid, as the great earth rolls on. what I was doing as I was interested in what he was doing and I think that, that there's an, an immediacy in Frank's work especially in the shorter poems that is roughly parallel to the kind of immediacy that a lot of painters including myself were involved with at that time why I'm not a painter I am not a painter I am a poet why I think I would rather be a painter but I am not well for instance, Mike Goldberg is starting a painting. I drop in. Sit down and have a drink, he says. I drink. We drink. I look up. You have sardines in it. Yes, it needed something there. Oh. The poem details, as points of reference, certain of the things that appeared in the painting that uh, ended up uh, being discarded uh, as important sort of signposts along the way of the painting's development. Uh, among them was the fact that I had written Exit at one point in the painting, and I'd written Sardines at another point in the painting. And uh, there was a point where uh, I got rid of most of the words themselves, left some of the letters. I go, and the days go by, and I drop in again. The painting is going on, and I go, and the days go by. I drop in. The painting is finished. Where's sardines? All that's left is just letters. It was too much, Mike says. I was eliminating certain specific content. And he paralleled that. I remember vividly uh, he was writing poems called Oranges at that point, uh, both uh, in relation to the color orange and to the actual physical orange. One day I'm thinking of a color, orange. I write a line about orange. Pretty soon, it is a whole page of words, not lines. Then another page. There should be so much more, not of orange, of words, of how terrible orange is and life. Days go by. It is even in prose. I am a real poet. <laughs> My poem is finished, and I haven't mentioned orange yet. It's 12 poems. I call it oranges. And one day, in a gallery, I see Mike's painting called sardines. 